Ouch. Kia Sportage 2012. Big crash. Altercation with a truck. Never good. No airbag deployment. WTF. Details next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where a strain new car buyers save thousands off their brand new cars. Friggin' thousands. Yes. Hit me up on the website for that. Captain's log, star date 21032020. We came out of warp drive yesterday and I inserted the fat cave geosynchronously above central Shitsville. The zombie apocalypse below appears to have intensified. Sensors indicate the condition gives brain-dead bogans below an insatiable hunger for toilet tissue. The only effective weapon appears to be hand sanitizer, which is very hard to weaponize at 1.5 meters. Water pistol supplies on board are running critically low. Must remember to conserve ammunition. I've instructed the crew to remain calm if mistaken in the supermarket for a display of double ply extra length discount rolls. Nobody deserves that. We've been practicing failure drills on the range weekly with live fire exercises deep in the bowels of the fat cave. Two sprays are required, center of mass, right between the boobies. Yes. And then one in the eyes in case they're wearing a wonder bra. If this keeps up, frankly, I do not know how much longer we can maintain current levels of, let's call it, um, probing. And now this, from a friend of a fan of my reports. I, I guess the friend of a fan is my fan. I, mean, I don't really know how this works. He might just be some dude who gets spammed by a toilet paper hoarder who has a crush on me. Anything's possible. My wife was involved in a serious crash in our 2012 Kia Sportage Platinum 2.4. Not a single airbag deployed during this accident. A truck did not stop at a stop sign and collided with my wife's car, hitting the front driver's side of her vehicle. Keen to hear your thoughts on why the airbags did not deploy for such a significant hit. Or is it possible that there was a fault with the system. Look, I get a handful of these questions every year. People go, understandably enough, I had a crash and I didn't get my airbags. What gives? So I called Fabio using the high-tech miracle of the handheld telephone. Thank you so much, Alexander Graham Bell. And I did that because having reviewed the pictures, right, that crash is dead set interesting. It's as if the truck has just peeled off the front bumper, the right hand guard and the bonnet. That's a hood. Miracle. But none of the structure designed to absorb energy during a crash by crumpling in a controlled way seems to have been that engaged. Structurally, the car actually looks pretty good if you can sort of sideline your perception of the cosmetic damage. So I asked Fabio the obvious elephant in the room question like, How's your wife, mate? Is she okay? And yeah, thankfully she is, okay? She suffered a few non-life-threatening injuries. She got a cut to the head, but her skull and brains are intact, thankfully. Broken collarbone, which is probably a consequence of the rotation about that, you know, vertical axis during the crash, but nothing requiring a stay in ICU and or the selection of a friggin' casket, because can you imagine how bleak the aftermath of that kind of thing is? I never want to go there. Don't get me wrong, okay? I'm not trivialising this. I'm sure for Mrs. Fabio, it was a shocking and very painful event, and she might even require further medical treatment and a bit of rehab, like she's got a piece of titanium currently holding her collarbone together. And having had fun occasionally in the past, I'm pretty sure that's not it. However, what people don't get, at least most people who haven't done a lot of applied science in this situation is that airbags are just not designed to prevent these kinds of non-life-threatening injuries. They're just not. They're designed to protect next level injury severity, okay? The kinds of injuries that kill you quickly at the roadside. See, if you look at a crash, serious crash, like a slow motion camera, you go frame by frame, 
down there in the millisecond domain, there's this tiny little window which occupies typically less than one tenth of one second and that's the bit where your internal organs collide with your skeleton. And there are structural limits on those parts that keep you going. It's unpalatable to think that we're all sort of bags of obscene glop that needs to keep functioning in order to keep us, us. If they collide hard enough, you know, for long enough, critical blood vessels inside you will fail. And if that happens, there's no afterwards, right? Or even worse, there is an afterwards and it's a living hell that's frankly worse than death. I'm not exaggerating here and I don't want to fear monger you about driving. Driving's safe if you do it properly. But having a severe brain injury is worse than death in many cases. This is, of course, why they use crash test dummies in R&D. Engineers making cars crash-worthy, they need to be able to relate the structural performance, frame by frame, of a car during a crash to the motion of the dummy so that they can figure out how effectively the structure's crumpling to absorb injury and mitigate the loads on the people and, of course, when exactly in the time domain to fire off the airbags and the pretensioners to save your life, if it's savable. And this is an incredibly precise process, okay, which is camouflaged by the visual brutality of the crash. That's why most people don't get it, because crashes are compelling to look at. You can't look away. But deep down at the design level, this is a kind of bizarre ballet on the boundary of life and death. And the decisions made in R&D really matter. You know, airbags need to move horrendously fast to get in place at exactly the right time to provide adequate, let's call it padding, even though it's not what you or I would consider to be soft like a pillow. But it does support you during that critical window and mitigate the loads. Airbag deployment is absolutely not risk-free, okay? If you're out of position, airbags can injure you seriously. And I'm looking at you, not to be sexist, but typically if you're a chick on the way home from the beach, on the passenger side, in the front seat, with your feet up on the dash, right above the airbag module. Good safety tip, don't do that. That crash must have seemed so violent and brutal, I'm sure. But in the context of life and death, it's not what I would categorise as serious. No grim reaper, no chalk, no poker-faced cops knocking on the door to inform the next of kin. And can you imagine doing that for a job? And this is why you should cut them a break when they stop you for speeding, because when they're not doing stuff like that, they're knocking on the door, and that's got to be hard. So, no airbags, but instead, Mrs. Fabio has won the biggest consolation prize on friggin' earth, in my view. In other words, she crashed into a truck, and yet, she's still here. That's a win. Those airbags did not go off because they were not needed. If you crash and there's no airbags, and afterwards you're aware what day it is, and you know where you are, and you understand that the Prime Minister of Australia is still a useless dickhead, then hey, the car was not defective because you have all your marbles. When you get over that shock, okay, you should write the car maker's structural design team a thank you letter, in my view. One more thing on this, okay, intersections. So dangerous, so damn dangerous because they seem so benign. You drive through them all the time. You drive down the road, you see a stop sign, truck approaches, it's just another day behind the wheel, right? We do this hundreds of times a week. You've got the software written for what you think is about to happen, yeah? According to neuroscience, okay, plans and memories are really the same thing. Plans are just memories of the future, kind of. That's why what you expect to happen seems so real in your mind, okay? Despite the fact that it's in the future and has not therefore had the opportunity to occur, seems so real. Effectively, you paint this picture in your head, which is a memory of the future. And in this memory, the truck stops and you drive on through completely unscathed again, like a thousand times before. And it seems so real. And then, of course, at that statistically rare moment when the truck does not stop, it's 
fucking hard to get in gear and deal with that because your memory of the future, which seems so real, and the actual future are suddenly kind of mismatched. And it's very difficult to sort that out in like half a second. We are bad at that as a species. So, pro tip, okay, you have to train yourself that intersections are dangerous, even though they seem not to be so. You have to double check that other vehicles are in fact obeying their give way obligations before you proceed into the danger zone. And they generally are obeying those obligations. And you can get away with not doing this for years, okay? But then once a while, you know, every rare grand alignment of the planets kind of thing, the hammer comes down on a loaded chamber and you lose. Unless you check habitually. So I'd suggest make it a habit. Get in the habit of checking every intersection. You just have to do this. It doesn't seem like much of a trade-off if you want to keep living, does it? And if anything looks iffy, just get off the gas and cover the brake and get ready to brake and or swerve, okay? That's why you drive habitually with your hands at nine and three, right? And it's why you've always got a snapshot in your head of all of the traffic around you, right? And if you don't, perhaps you should start doing those things too. Now that I think about it, some crashes, clearly not that bad. Imagine her breaching those giveaway obligations and crashing into you, unscripted, changing your memory of the future with a <laughs> full airbag deployment. <laughs> Just saying. This episode, of course, proudly sponsored by my good friend, The Wheel. So friggin' versatile. Now, I don't often praise marketing assholes, as you know, but I am forced to give 13 points out of a possible 10 to Casio here for overall automotive awareness, motoring nuance and getting the details bang on in promoting the new G-Shock Range Man wristwatch, the Leatherman of timepiece multi-tools. Take a look. So, serious tactical dude driving through some third world shithole like, I don't know, Queensland. Obviously a brave fucker too. I mean, doing that in a Jeep, what could possibly go wrong? Well, yeah, there's that. It's frankly surprising to me that he got that far. But don't worry, spoiler alert, he gets saved by the watch, unsurprisingly. The mighty G-Shock range man turns him into Jack Bauer, essentially, and he gets back to civilization intact. Importantly, they leave the shitbox Jeep in the desert to rot, and they all lived happily ever after. Yes, especially Jeep's lawyers and Cassios, I presume. This fine, uplifting production, a rare example of truth in advertising, a black comedy of the reality of Jeep ownership, exists on the Casio G-Shock YouTube channel. You should check it out. There's a link in the description. An upbeat interlude, Casio's brilliant four-minute micro-movie might even divert you briefly from the grim reality of the zombie apocalypse taking place on the surface of the planet, down there beneath the fat cave, on a confrontingly post-toilet paper planet. <laughs>